Hey guys, I'm, I'm Dan McCollum. Uh, it's a tough act to follow after uh, awesome lectures, you know, Bennett, chest pain, and then sepsis uh, from three really great teachers that I've learned from immensely. And then Matt gave me the privilege of covering all of medical literature in 30 minutes, and I thank him for it, for such a narrow topic and so long to do it in. So uh, we're gonna just like crash through the medical literature. Uh, it's really an honor to speak in front of you guys, and I really love the diversity of the group here. So I know that we've got you know, PAs, we've got nurse practitioners, we've got physicians, we've got administrators, but don't identify yourself. You know, they, we've got all these different folks, so please stop me at any point, because we are literally just crashing through the literature. If there's something you want to talk about, let's do it, okay? So don't have any real conflicts of interest. I accidentally make money occasionally for education, I just give it all away. Um, so, where do I get these articles? There's an awesome app called Read by QXMD. Uh, it's free on the App Store. If you have access to an institution that gives you access um, to uh, journals, then you can actually read things like New England Journal and JAMA and Annals of Emergency Medicine through this app, and it's far easier than trying to keep up with all the paper stuff that you're going to lose. By the way, because um, I saw a lot of people taking notes, we're going to do our darndest to post all of these things to YouTube and get the links to you shortly, okay? Um, so hopefully we'll have all this in recorded forms from as many of these lectures as we can capture if I didn't screw it up, which is likely. <laughs> so I follow a lot of journals. You shouldn't. You should listen to other people that follow a lot of journals because it takes up too much of my life, but I enjoy it. So the first study, this is Crash 2. This is huge for those of you that take care of trauma patients, okay? It's not a very complex study, it's just a very useful one. So what was CRASH-2? They basically used a drug called transexamic acid, which is more or less a, a drug that promotes clotting, just enough. Now anyone that reads the literature about things that thin the blood or thicken up the blood know what a nightmare it is. I'm not gonna subject you to the clotting cascade. That's not gonna be here, okay? So it's really, really hard to both clot the blood just enough to where you don't immediately have a stroke or to thin the blood just enough to where you don't immediately bleed out. It's really, really delicate. And it turns out transexamic acid is actually great for this. So this was an international trial with over 20,000 patients in a ton of countries. Some of these were very developed, including sites in the US. Some of them weren't. So there were places in South America and Africa that were included here. The amazing thing is they had incredible benefits in mortality. So the mortality was 14.5% <coughs> amongst these severe trauma patients that got transexamic acid versus 16 with placebo. So that's not a huge absolute difference, only one and a half percent, but that means every 67 trauma patients that you see and give this drug to, you save a lot. There are very few things in medicine that have a number needed to treat that low. This is on the order of what happens when you give aspirin to people actively having an MI, okay? It's only about half as good as aspirin for an MI, but you'd be crazy to have someone without a contraindication having a STEMI and you not give them an aspirin. And I feel that if you have a trauma, a trauma patient within three hours of when they show up, you'd be crazy not to give this medicine. It's really, really cheap. It costs about 30 bucks a pop, depending on your system. And there's no reason not to use it. Now, there was some signal in the, the study that after three hours, maybe people got a little bit less benefit. Maybe if you go really far out there, more in the six hour territory, some people may have actually been harmed, okay? So it's not a panacea. But the reality is that most of your trauma patients in America get you within three hours, okay? I say that because it's a little bit less clear if there's a prolonged extrication, someone was at the scene for five hours and then finally got to you. Maybe this isn't as helpful, but absolutely, if you're thinking of giving blood, the next order should be this medicine. And that's the people that they focused on, is basically anyone that they thought that would receive multiple units of blood. That's crash two. This is a less useful paper. This is a guy named James DeCanto who learned how to intubate underwater. And he really did this on some mannequins, and it's amazing, but perhaps not applicable to your environment. Uh, he basically combined an oscillator, which is a weird respiratory device, with scuba gear, and found out that, amazingly, he could actually intubate and ventilate people without ever surfacing. I talked to him about this for a long time. He's really excited about it, and I love the guy. He's amazing. Uh, but it may not be applicable to your environment if you're a terrestrial in location. <laughs> so next up we've got no DSAT, okay? Now this is something that has been one of the biggest changes in my practice in the last few years. So very often we'll have patients in front of us that we're trying to intubate and one of the reasons we're intubating them is that their SATs aren't very good. So we've all seen that person, their SATs are already 90% or so, and we say, okay, we'd like to RSI them. So we want to take away their ability to breathe, which already was terrible, and we're gonna make them paralyzed so that they can't breathe. 
And we're going to try not to bag them too much because we know that's going to introduce a lot of air and they're going to vomit and there's going to be lots of bad stuff because they're not fasting ever. So what do you do? You, you, you paralyze them and then you watch that number go from 90 to the 70s no matter how quick you are. It doesn't matter if you get that tube in within seconds. It's always back, right? So what did they figure out? They figured out that we could actually greatly increase the amount of time that we have to intubate by simply applying a nasal cannula while you're intubating. So what this does is passive apneic oxygenation, meaning that even if you're not breathing, even if you're absolutely paralyzed, if you put a nasal cannula in your nose and then crank it up really high, so 15 liters or higher, you can actually really, really, uh, or five liters for, for most of the nasal cannulas, if you crank it up that high, you'll actually continue to oxygenate. Okay, so what we do is we combine a non-rebreather at 15 liters along with a nasal cannula at five. It's actually pretty comfortable. Okay? People have experimented with different amounts. I mean, you can actually go safely higher with the nasal cannula if you want. You may dry out the nose a little bit, but this actually buys you a lot of time. So that person that you had 10 seconds to throw the tube in, now you get a lot longer. They actually took healthy folks and tried this on it, and it turns out in healthy people, you could actually maintain your oxygen sats for many minutes. There were people over 10 minutes of being paralyzed, not breathing, and they kept their sats up. Does your CO2 rise? Absolutely. Do I care? Not at all. As long as they're not incredibly acidotic, most people can handle a bump in their CO2, okay? And that's fine. And then you just keep that nasal cannula on. Now this is gonna take some training of your staff because they're gonna, they're gonna see that you get the nasal cannula on and you put the face mask on, that's great. And then you're gonna take the nasal cannula, or you're gonna take the face mask off and get ready to intubate. And they're like, whoa, 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 we're gonna pull this off. You don't need to. It doesn't get in the way at all. It actually buys you that little bit of extra time. So then there's a the concept of delayed sequence intubation. And Rich was kind of tiptoeing up to this a little bit during his lecture. Uh, sometimes we want people to be awake while we're intubating, okay? Because we know that if we, if we paralyze them and then we can't intubate them, we get into serious trouble because we took away their ability to breathe, okay? This is particularly relevant for folks out in rural areas, okay? Because there is no backup. You're 40 minutes from the nearest you know, person that's gonna come in and save you. So if you paralyze them and then you can't get the tube, you're either proceeding to a surgical airway or something like that, it, it just gets really bad really quick. So this is basically a procedural sedation to pre-oxygenate, okay? We've all seen that person that is so incredibly altered because of how hypoxic they are, that, that asthmatic that's 85%, and they're just, they're just flailing around, they're, they're ripping off the mask, you're trying to put an IV on them, and you can't because they just can't control themselves, okay? We've seen that person. So what do you do? You basically sedate them with an agent like ketamine is almost perfect for this. And then you allow them to pre-oxygenate by putting them on NIV. Now this violates one of the biggest rules of NIV, which is you only do it to awake people that can prevent their airway. And that's true. You only use NIV if they're awake, unless you're going to stay in the room with them. So what do you do? You set up as if you're going to do an RSI on them. You basically give them ketamine, let them chill out, put a non-invasive ventilator on them, and leave them on CPAP or BiPAP for a little while to get that sat up. So that person before that should appropriately scare you to death, having sats below 90%, because as soon as you paralyze them, that 90 is going to rapidly plummet, no matter how quick you are. If you can throw that tube in at 15 seconds, if they start off at 90% and you paralyze them, they are still going to plummet to unsafe levels of hypoxia. Period. There's just no way around it, even with the nasal cannula. So they took this study where they basically took a few dozen people that were actually already in that jeopardy zone. Okay, they were under 91%. And 93% of them approved <coughs> the SATs that were above 93% where it was safe. Okay? So basically you took those folks that were most in jeopardy and you turned them into folks that were actually reasonable people that you could intimate. This is huge. So before you, you take that person that's high risk and you know that there's something up, try this to oxygenate them a little bit more in advance, if you need to. So, this is a little bit less useful. How fast can you swim in syrup? <laughs> so this was a debate that I think the physics nerds had for a while. Of, could you swim as well in water as you could in maple syrup? And someone ended up getting what's called an ignoble prize, which is where people ask questions that don't immediately have uses, but are really awesome nonetheless. It turns out that you're just as fast swimming through syrup as you are in water. Just thought you should know that. Uh, but how did this come up? Well, it turns out in 1919, Boston had this huge molasses tank that made a 40-foot tsunami of molasses. <laughs> and it's still funny despite killing 21 people because that is an enormous wall of molasses. <laughs> and the pictures of this, of it, just, it destroyed blocks of the town because 
If you get hit with water that was 40 foot tall, that's pretty bad. If it's a 40 foot tall wall of molasses, you're done for. And so it was actually a really amazing pose. You should Google it, it's incredible. So yeah, but if you ever jump into a pool of surf, you can absolutely swim through it. <laughs> so this unpronounceable name is one of the most important medicines to come out in the last five years. So sofosbuvir, uh, yeah, I, I gave up on that. Uh, the problem with it is that this drug while revolutionizing how we treat hepatitis C is actually going to make us all go bankrupt soon. So let's talk about why. So the brand name is Sivaldi, and this drug is incredible. Okay, I am one of those folks known for only using generic names whenever possible, and I'm generally kind of antagonist to Big Pharma. I'm sorry for those of you that are part of Big Pharma, they may be in the room, that's okay. But this drug is incredible, okay? This is not one of those we came up with something that's kind of like lisinopril, but it's got a different name, and so we patented it and made a lot of money. This stuff is great. So it cures 94 to 99% of people with hepatitis C. The old treatments that were mostly interferon-based cured about 50%. And hepatitis C is one of the biggest killers in the world. So absolutely fantastic drug, very, very few side effects, much, much fewer than interferon. But there's a problem. It costs a thousand dollars a pill, which would be great if there was only one pill. Unfortunately, you really kind of sort of have to take about 90 of those pills because it's a mini week course and it costs about 90 grand to treat. Now, the problem is that 90 grand actually ends up saving the healthcare system money because I'm sure you guys have all seen the person with the CITES that comes in like every few days with belly pain and maybe they get a paracentesis, maybe they don't. They get admitted to the unit all the time. This is really expensive. So this drug is actually a slight cost saver despite the fact that it costs this much. Now how much does this drug cost to make? It costs about $250 to make. So there's a little bit of a problem there and this is an amazing drug that more and more people need. Why you need to know about it is the fact that if you've got someone with hepatitis C that's chronic and they come in for some other reason, they probably don't know about this because it just came out a couple of years ago. Okay? This was the second biggest selling drug in America last year and no one knows its name. It's just kind of crazy the amount of money that they're making. But it's an incredibly helpful therapy for your chronic hep C folks. And if they haven't seen a GI doctor because they basically said there's not much we could do and, and they last saw them four or five years ago but are suffering from symptomatic hepatitis C because they failed interferon therapy, they need to go back. And so it's very reasonable for us to pick up these folks because they come to the ER so often and get them plugged in. So what about upper GI bleeding? A very rare condition that never happened, I'm just kidding, it happens all the time, right? So how much should you transfuse to, okay? Now, Brad just mentioned with sepsis that we're not really sure what the, the transfusion threshold is. It's probably seven is good enough for most of us, okay? Well, what is it for GI bleeding? And if you ask people, they're all over the board. I've met GI folks that wanted to transfuse, even though they're above 10, saying, oh, they're bleeding a lot of blood, they're probably gonna drop, you should go ahead and give them a couple units. Then I've met some other very, you know, steely faced ones. Oh, yeah, the hemoglobin six, but we can do this. We don't, we don't need to stop it. So it goes everywhere across the spectrum. So they basically randomized people to transfuse at a hemoglobin of seven versus nine. And it turns out that there was a significant mortality benefit to the people that got less blood. Okay? I want to repeat that. The people that got less blood ended up dying less often. Okay? So how many people do you need to not give blood to? To, to save a life, and it's 25. Another way to put that is if you keep giving blood at nine, you uh, need to see 25 people to kill somebody, but that's less friendly. So let's just say that we <laughs> save one out of 25 as opposed to kill one out of 25. It just seems nice. <coughs> now, they've done further studies on this, and it was a little bit less robust in follow-up studies, so this is a little bit controversial, but it should make you very comfortable with that person that's got a hemoglobin over seven and hemodynamically stable, that you can wait and admit them. Now, a key part of this study that may not be perfectly applicable to especially the rural environment is that these po folks mostly get endoscopy fairly quickly, okay? So if you're at a hospital where endoscopy happens on three different hours on three different days of the week when the GI guy, guy comes in, this may not fully apply to you, okay? So if you're mid on Saturday night, you know the endoscopy is not going to happen until Monday. It, you may want to transfuse slightly higher, especially if you don't have a system that can catch people if they get sicker. Because we know that these GI bleeders often end up getting sick really quick, and then when they do that, if they don't get caught quickly, they die, okay? which is one of the terrifying things about this disease. But if you are in a reasonable hospital that can handle it, 
try for hemoglobin of seven. It's actually a really effective way to go. So this is just an amazing x-ray. Uh, this, <laughs> this actually got published in the BMJ. And one of the authors was uh, proficient at sword swallowing. And uh, I love x-rays where things aren't supposed to be where they are. And this line just keeps going. Um, he said that he could actually get the sword deeper, but he just ate Chinese food. Uh, so, <laughs> so that's what prevented him. But that's actually where it goes. You have to actually move your esophagus over a little bit while you're doing it, and then suppress all these involuntary, well, involuntary for me, but voluntary for this guy. He has to actually flip up his epiglottis to actually get it down that far. And the, the author is actually able to swallow seven swords at once, which seems like at least six swords more than is really needed to impress me. Uh, but this won another Ig Nobel Prize. Uh, so peripheral vasopressors, Brad just mentioned this, and it's really important for you guys to know. Traditionally, we only give pressors through a central line because bad stuff happens when they come out. If it leaks out of that IV and it gets out in the tissue, then you can have dead tissue, and that's bad. Nobody likes dead tissue. But the reality is some places are either under such pressure to get the person up to an ICU or to transfer them out. Maybe you're at a shop that's not very comfortable with putting in central lines, and I get it. Some, some people haven't put in a lot of central lines, and ultrasound can certainly help you get proficient to safely do that. Okay? But the reality is that, that not every shop is ready to throw in a central line quickly in a sterile fashion, and, and I understand. So can you give peripheral vasopressors safely? And the answer is largely yes. This is the most impressive study of it. They looked at 325 bad things happening from vasopressors leaking out of lines. Okay? So these are only the bad things. And it turns out the central lines were very, very safe, and the peripheral lines had 98% of the adverse events. Now, that sounds really bad. That sounds pretty damning that, that maybe we shouldn't be putting this stuff through peripheral lines. Until you look at what was really going on, most of them were mine. So sure, they leaked out and the tissue got a little bit upset, but it got better. It was okay. And only 7% of them had gangrene. And most of the time that this happened, these lines were in for a really long time because the mean duration of these events were 56 hours. That's how long the line was in. So if you say, hey, is it safe? for me to throw in a peripheral line on this guy that's sick, ship him to the ICU or transfer him to the big hospital down the road and have him on a norepi drip for two hours while that happens? And I think the answer is pretty robustly yes. It's much safer than if you aren't comfortable with putting in a central line or can't do it sterily, don't have ultrasound. I, I, I get it that, that different shops have different capabilities. I would much rather get a patient transferred from a, a rural hospital that had norepi going through a line and get a, a hypotensive patient that's looking really sick, or have someone not be able to put in a central line and cause a big complication from it. Now, does that mean that you should turn away from doing central lines later? No. If you can get that skill and get your, your shop to be able to do it, that's great. Ultrasound and guided IJs are, are really a game changer for people that are new to putting in central lines. But I think this shows that, that for short durations, it's actually pretty safe to do this. So what about AFib? So you get that AFib with the RVR patient, so the, the rate's going really fast, you're like, what agent do I want to use? And it, it almost made like a Sharks versus Jets West Side story of people that like calcium channel blockers versus beta blockers. And if you ask two cardiologists, they'd have three different opinions about it. And everyone was certain that they were right. And it turns out only one of them was. So <laughs> this is an ER study. Basically, DILT just smoked metoprolol, okay? It's faster, it's better, and it causes no more complications than the beta blockers. Can you eventually get the heart rate lower with beta blockers? Sure. <coughs> Why would you though? DILT's not very expensive. It's a good drug. It gets excellent control quickly so that you can titrate it faster. And what you'll find if you get used to using DILT is that some of these folks maybe, and I say maybe, maybe might be able to go home after you get them adjusted with DILT and then transfer to a PO <coughs> DILT. Now, the problem is, if you're using beta blockers and it takes you four hours to get them under control, you probably already admitted that guy, unless you're really just wanting to hang on to them forever in your ER. So this could actually end up saving a tremendous amount of money because it could decrease admissions if you have reasonable people that are looking great and you can get them under good rate control. So I almost exclusively use DILT. Be very careful if your DILT doesn't work and then you add on beta blockers. Um, people that mix those two things together, it's very unpredictable what happens after you give that beta blocker because sometimes they, they drop the pressure really quick or the heart rate gets a lot slower really quickly. Be very cautious when you're doing that and consider very short acting beta blockers like Esmolol because that will wear off quicker if you are backed up and you're part of the 4% that didn't get good control with DILT. But if you stick with it, DILT just does a fantastic job with this. So can you levitate a frog with a magnet? 
It's a little bit less relevant, but it's not just frogs. You can levitate anything that's living with a big enough magnet. This was another Ig Nobel Prize winner. It did not harm the frog, which was the amazing thing because I figured it just killed it. But the thing just floats, and it's an amazing video. No one has quite built a big, big enough magnet to try this on a person, but I'm highly interested. This is also the only scientist to ever win a Nobel Prize and an Ig Nobel Prize, which is amazing. He uh, helped do some work on graphene, which is this really sweet thing with like single layers of carbon, which I will not bore you more about. But if you want him to talk about graphene later, let's do it. <laughs> Next up, cellulitis, a rare and hardly ever heard of condition. No, no, it's, again, very common. So this is a classic debate, and this, this also goes deep to like sharks versus jets territory. Do, do you do Clinda, or do you do trametoprim sulfamethoxazole, or Bactrim for people that aren't crazy about brand names? So which is better? And it turns out they're fine. Both work, OK? So I thought Clinda's more expensive it's got a broader spectrum. Surely it, it kills more bugs. These people get better quicker with Clinda, right? And so for the longest time, it's like you've got insurance or can afford <coughs> Clinda, which locally for us is somewhere in the order of like 75 bucks or so if you're uninsured. So if you've got that in your pocket, I was like, yeah, I'll give you the good stuff. And like, oh, well, you can't afford anything. Well, this drug's $4 at Walmart. And so I'll give them the other stuff. And I felt really bad about it until I found this paper. And there was no difference in outcome after a 10-day course. And this is so much cheaper that the number of folks that I gave Clinda to and I thought that they could afford it, maybe they couldn't, or, or their insurance got dropped or whatever, it just is so much better, okay? And it's just such a cheaper drug. So proper trial, th this is part of the, the debate about what you should give to your trauma patients, okay? So everyone knows that if you have a trauma patient, they're shot in the leg and they lose a bunch of red stuff on the ground, that you'd like to replace it with whole blood. And the military has done a remarkably good job of doing studies where they're actually giving cold blood um, because they can. They've got a living blood bank where they can say like, hey, Marine, come over here. We're going to get some blood from you and we're going to give it to that person. And they can do that because they're in the military and they're always tested all the time. And so they, they actually have a wonderful mobile blood bank. And they found that, that is much, much better than we're just giving you packed red blood cells or just plasma or just platelets because it's got all the red stuff and not just some of the red stuff. Okay, And that makes sense. And that's so much better than just giving a bunch of water and salt water crystalloid stuff to your trauma patients, which honestly is almost never the right move. Um, it's almost always a bad thing to have a trauma patient and you'd be giving them salt water. I'm not saying that patient doesn't exist, but that patient really doesn't exist. Okay? It really should be red stuff or nothing. Okay? Again, I understand at your local shop, you may not be able to get blood within an hour or two when they hit the door, but that crystalloid does almost nothing good for them. Okay? So if at all possible, don't give salt water, give blood. But they said, well, we're in America. We don't have this mobile blood bank. So we, we're stuck with packed red blood cells and fresh frozen plasma and platelets. And what ratio should we give? Okay, and there were folks that were in the, let's do what the military does basically, and basically make our own whole blood. One to one to one stop. Meaning that you get one unit of platelets, one unit of plasma, one unit of packed red blood cells for each time that you're giving blood. Versus, do we do one to one to two, meaning that it's only for every two units of packed red blood cells do we give the plasma and platelets, which works better. So this was actually a very impressive trial, and it's technically negative. Okay, the statistics nerds out there reading this will find that it does not meet its primary outcome of showing that the one to one to one ratio is actually better. Okay, so the people that actually got the true whole blood stuff wasn't quite statistically better than the people that got two units of, of red cells for every one unit of plasma platelets. However, there was a 4% improvement in mortality. And the truth was the study just wasn't big enough to prove the thing that they wanted to show. But it was statistically significant that they bled to death less <coughs> within the first couple of days. Okay, the, the outcome was appropriately for, let's see what happens in I think 30 days, um, but they, they didn't quite reach statistical significance. That being said, most of the people that are kind of movers and shakers in trauma are agreeing that this one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one ratio is probably the way to go. Because it showed that that early time period, so especially if you're in a rural place and you're like, I really need to get this guy alive to another place where they have trauma surgeons and whatnot, this is probably where I would go. Now this group of folks was largely a group that were getting massive transfusion protocols activated. So they were assuming that you were going to get six or more units of blood. And if you think about the number of traumas that get that, 
that's actually a fair number of, of folks. Um, because you don't know how much they're going to need. You know that there's blood in the belly and they're in some sort of terrible car crash. You don't really know. And so I have a very, very low threshold of pulling the trigger on this. Do we have any questions at all? Thank you all very much for your time.